Hi folks, I'm John Pearl. I work for State Representative Kelly Cassidy here in the 14th District in Chicago. We are in lovely Andersonville on Clark Street, uh, 5,000 block, I think. Um, and I will be talking about the school funding issue and what just happened, I believe, on Monday. So to you all and to anyone who may be watching. Uh, so just to start back, we a couple decades ago, we, start, we have a school funding formula in Illinois that has been... Um, <laughs> wildly inequitable. So it has been such that back in the 70s it might have made sense. I Now the practical effect that it had was schools like the Chicago Public Schools were being drastically underfunded. So, and, and that's not just true of CPS by the way. The interesting thing about this is rural schools all over the state of Illinois, the schools typically that have the highest need uh, lowest income students, received the least funding. This is whether this was intentional or not, I couldn't say. It was decades, decades ago. But that's the school funding system we had. It was ranked most inequitable in the nation. So that's where we were starting from. This is the place we started from. And for the past five years or so, a lot of representatives, including uh, Senator Andy Menar downstate, is one of the sort of been the face of it. Um, Kelly, my boss, has been working on this for a long time as well. And so this finally started to become a possibility, a reality, about a year ago. So they actually introduced a bill. It was entitled, as someone mentioned, SB1 at the time, Senate Bill 1. And what happened was this was supposed to be part of, you've all probably heard of the budget crisis we had. Mm -hmm. Two years, no budget. Mm -hmm. One of the eventual solutions was supposed to be, okay, we have to come together on a whole host of issues. We've got a Republican governor, two Democratic chambers. How can we get them to agree? Well, part of it, so let's get a budget, but let's also do education funding reform. Let's get a bunch of things done as part of this grand bargain was the term that they started using for it. You might have heard in the news. Yeah. So eventually, we got a bill that was actually really widely supported. I mean, in the end, the goal was don't decrease the funding for any school, but increase the funding for a lot of schools, not the, you know, the nutriers of the world, God bless them, but the ones that actually needed to get up to adequacy is the word that we were using. So adequacy, like just this, the minimum amount to function in a way that actually educates children effectively. How can we get to adequacy for every school in Illinois, every public school? So that's, and it, that would have, so the bill that we had would have given, would have injected about another $270 million into the system and brought us up to adequacy eventually in about five years, I think is the goal, chunks every year. Um, and think of 2022 or something, we're trying to get to adequacy for every Illinois school. That was going fine. Um, the package eventually sort of deteriorated because Governor Rauner, as you may have heard, is notoriously difficult to negotiate with. He doesn't, he, he will change from day to day what he wants. He moves the goalposts very frequently. And eventually he was saying um, that, no, this isn't good enough. We don't want, so the, the whole budget package sort of started to fall apart. Mm -hmm. um, he hates Mike Madigan, the speaker. The speaker hates him back. Uh, they, they played a lot of games for a lot of years, and a lot of people got hurt. And in the end, this sort of deteriorated. The problem is, the, the, when they passed a budget, when they eventually finally overcame these two, and the, the sort of House Democrats and Republicans sort of came together and rose up against their leadership um, and passed a budget, they did not fund the schools this fall. They did that intentionally because they wanted to force this education funding reform bill. So in this summer, you may have heard, there was a real risk that we were not going to open schools this fall. Uh, we got to the point where you have to pass a bill, and if you don't pass it, the language in the budget we passed was, you have to fund schools and change the funding formula. I'm sorry about that. You have to make the funding formula equitable or schools don't get funded at all. So that's the point we got to. So this SB1 eventually negotiated, 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 and we got to a really good bill that everyone supported. Until. Um, you may have heard there was the private school voucher program got inserted in there. Let me just give you a brief rundown of that because that's, it's very important to what just happened two days ago. The governor said, and many Republicans said, we'll support giving all these, this more money and make these schools adequate if you let us um, take people's tax donations, like like pick, take tax dollars that would be paid by typically very wealthy people, let them write it off and give it to private and religious schools as scholarships. 
Um, this is a sort of a Koch brothers, Betsy DeVos style, um, take money away from the public schools, give them to the private and religious schools uh, sort of idea. And this has been instituted in several other states. And effectively, um, very wealthy people, you may have read, the, the program started, so we eventually passed this bill. Um, my boss did not support it. Uh, it was very heartbreaking for her because she had to eventually vote no on the whole package, which included a great education funding reform bill that we, we loved uh, because it was tied to this school vouchers program that ended up, um, it's 75 million, it actually capped it at $100 million. So that's $100 million tax dollars that could be going to the state, actual public schools, as instead uh, going to private schools. And the way they sell this is, well, we gotta, you know, we gotta give educational opportunities to low-income kids. Truth is, most of these scholarships go to kids who are already in private school, mm. okay? And more importantly, when you take two or three kids out of a public school and give them these scholarships sent them to private school, first of all, the education may be better, it may not be. We, they're not accountable. We don't, we, don't, we don't regulate private schools that way. So we don't even know if it's better. And B, every dollar that you, every, every kid you take out of a public school decreases their funding. So now you're, all of their peers, it might be great for the one kid who gets the scholarship, all of their peers now get less money. You can't save education by taking a couple dozen kids and moving them to private school. We want to work for all the kids in Illinois, most of whom are not going to be lucky enough to get these scholarships. So she ended up having to vote no on this whole package. It passed. Uh, the good news is that that means that CPS and a lot of other schools are going to get a lot more money in the future. The bad news is this private school scholarship thing, which we're going to try to repeal when the governor's out of office. So that, that happened in the summer, so schools opened. Uh, this just, that just happened two days ago, and I'm, so that was the background. What just happened two days ago was uh, that bill was very complicated. So ISBE, the Illinois State Board of Education, said, we need you to, to write another bill, just to, some technical fixes, just to make sure that that bill works as intended. Everyone says, okay, they do it, it passed unanimously. It's just cleanup language, it's called, the trailer bill, just to fix what was in the first one. Uh, and the governor, out of nowhere, two days ago, vetoed that bill um, in a mandatory veto, it's known as. He said, no, that, that's fine, the language you wanted is fine, but uh, we need to give, we need to open up the private school scholarships even more. Oh, <laughs> oh God. That's, that is the reasoning, and the way he wrote the bill was, so... In the original, it says, to get to qualify for these scholarships, you have to be a uh, registered, what is, I forget what the language is, registered, so there's, there's this weird technical difference, right? So you have to be a recognized private school, okay? So that means that you are licensed, at least, by the State Board of, Elect uh, State Board of Education. Governor Rauner's a mandatory veto of this past bill said, no, let's open it up to um, registered schools. There's a whole, so there's like a waiting period. You want to open a private school, you register with the State Board of Education, and in a couple years, if you're good enough, they recognize you. Uh, by opening it up to registered, it, it's a couple dozen more, mostly Catholic schools and whatnot, um, that no one, no one really knows what's going on there, um, that would also be eligible for what should be tax money. Again, we're talking about what should be public money going to religious education. Um, and so he wanted to open it up even more. And so he vetoed this bill. Um, that is also, and the, the, our position, by the way, is that that was uh, not allowed. You can't make laws by veto. You, so he basically rewrote the bill and said, here's my veto. Uh, it's noncompliant. We don't believe that you can do that. The governor is an executive who can say yes or no to a piece of legislation. They can't write the bill themselves. And that's essentially what he's trying to do is override the power of the legislature to make laws. So that veto is not going to stand. So the, the, there's really two options now. Let the bill die, and then we don't know, because this, this cleanup language that they tried to pass was important. I mean, this is to make the, the fund, education funding reform work. So we can either let that die, and God knows, I mean, we'll see if the money starts being distributed, or we're going to try to do is override the veto. Now, I brought with me, in case anyone's interested, and this is not for reading, but for passing around, it passed 73 to 34, okay, initially, the first time, this whole education funding reform package. Um, you need 71 to override a, gov a gubernatorial veto. So there are enough people who initially voted yes to override that veto. That includes several Republicans, though. 
So in case anyone's curious about, well, what should we do? I mean, I didn't, you, can, you guys can make copies yourselves, but here is the list of people who voted yes. If all of them, even if you lose two, if all of them vote to override the veto, this doesn't matter. The education funding reform bill goes on as we had planned, which is great. Uh, we hate the private school scholarships thing, but we're hoping to get that repealed before it really goes into effect anyway, uh, because, I mean, we're hoping that the governor will be out of office in November. Um, so on the whole, the news is still okay on this front, but we don't, I mean, we really need to override this veto because in March is when these new school payments are supposed to start going out. And without this technical cleanup language that he vetoed, uh, it's up in the air a bit. So that, that's sort of the situation is we want, all of those people who wanted that education funding bill to pass to vote again to see it actually implemented correctly, you know? And the governor will pressure them to vote no, as he has done successfully on some occasions, but mm. we'll see. I mean, that's the, that's the goal now, is to make sure that people on that list um, vote to override his veto. So, that, and I'm open to any questions about that or anything else. Yes, ma'am? Do you expect that um, Representative Cassie will vote to override the it's a great question. And you know what? So I talked to her. We just had an event last night, and I started talking to her about it. She's. This is something, it's an interesting issue, because she wants this education bill to be implemented. And so I, my, I expect that she will vote to override. Um, in fact, I'm almost sure of it. But it's tough, because the, the whole package entails accepting this private school scholarships aspect, which is something that she hates. I mean, it's tax money for religious schools, you know? and and. But, but this, we, I mean, we're, we, that already passed, so it's too late for that. So I think she will vote to override this, yeah. Yeah, because at this point, we need to make sure at the very least that this funding formula gets fixed the way we intended to fix it. So, yeah. Tough, but. When yeah, is yeah. that? Oh, sorry. No, go, go ahead. When is the vote? Uh, so they're, they're going back into session, in, what's it, the 10th, in 12 days. So my guess is that v and probably in that first week, depending on the whip votes and see who's, Yes, who's no, but is, they'll probably call it fairly quickly, is my guess. Yeah, so probably in the next two weeks. Uh, and then, ma'am, did you have a question? Yeah, so if they override the veto, that will allow the language to be changed? Yep. <coughs> yep. Changed yep, back to where the way they intended it to be. And yeah. the, the thing, he negotiated this whole bill. He signed the education funding reform bill. Again, now he's moving the goalposts, as we say, changing his mind. <laughs> He could have negotiated this in the first place, but he didn't. So, so what should we do? Call? Well, yeah. So look at that list. See, is my representative, is my senator on there? If so, make sure. Even if they're a yes, make sure. Are you calling? Say, are you going to vote to override if they bring this up for an override vote? Because we need seventy-one in the House and thirty-six and thirty-six in the Senate. And should we call even if we're not in the district? Um, that, so that one to me is always an interesting proposition because a lot of people will tell you that it, it can't hurt, and that's true. I, I will also say as the person who receives calls um, that w if someone's not in the district, I can't, I can't really take their opinion into account, you know, because like I have my job is to represent my constituents. Um, so you can, uh, though it's, it, it, you know, it's 50-50 as to whether they'll really, uh, if you, some, some people will even hang up on, I don't hang up on people, but we we'll just say, oh, you're not in the district? All right. So, yeah, you know, so it's up to you. But th this is when we uh, appeal to our friends and neighbors. Precisely. <laughs> yeah. Precisely. You all have friends and neighbors who live in districts where this is a, a good idea for them to, to make some calls. I apologize for the format of that, by the way. It has their last name. So what you would just do is just Google representative and that last name if you want to find, like, what district they are and their contact information. I can also share with you how to find who your own representatives are. Just curious to see. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Even yeah. If not in my yeah, yeah. It's it's well, it's an interesting list because it's many very. I'm sorry about that. Many very conservative Republicans who didn't want the school funding to be fixed at all, and uh, many very progressive liberals who wanted it to be fixed but hated the part where um, the private school scholarships. So we have a weird little thing there. But it'll give them time to fund it in March. So the the plan has been um, to start the payments in March. So to start, you know, really to like the schools that have the highest need to start making those payments in the next couple months, and we we don't know. I mean, it's so technical. I would need to talk to a lawyer to figure out if that's still going to happen if this doesn't get overridden. So 
uh, you want to do that and just make sure that they start going out because, man, these schools are, mm-hmm. they're in trouble. So they're hurting. So, yeah. So, uh, you know, there's that. And then, um, you know, I'm open to any other questions on the state government stuff you guys have as well. When did this, um, when did this funding formula start in the 70s? I want to say that the last time they changed it was in the 70s. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Because I know when I went to school, it was like some of you might have gone to public school too in Chicago. Yeah. It was fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> it Things have really changed over the years. I mean, it, uh, it, Rep. Jan Schakowsky, the congresswoman sure. for most of you, went to Sullivan, mm-hmm. stepped away. Things have changed a lot at Sullivan. A lot. Yep. Who did that? Well, part, partly it's just been uh, the, the neighborhood is now mostly low income, mostly mm-hmm. refugee. And so when, mm-hmm. when that happens, in a crazy way, resources tend to flee. You know? And, and so what, what administration precipitously? Because my son graduated from Sullivan. Absolutely. Went, went down to like 300 for a school that could support 1,000. It's back up to about five, 560. Mm-hmm. Do you know what administration did that? Um, you mean uh, state administration or yes, Chicago? Yes, I, you know, I want to say what was daily. It was, the it was daily. one. It got to be one of them. Yeah, I mean they go back so far. I think yeah, the oldest, the oldest one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that. Um, I just yeah. In this in the state, you don't know who was. No, and and it goes back so far. I think even Mike Madigan wasn't even in office yet, which is saying something. <laughs> it's been about 36, 38 years for him. So yeah, it's about Anybody time. Anybody have any other questions about? Funding. Yeah. Anybody online have any questions about school funding? Watching online, just put them in the comments. If not, maybe John, you could bring up one other issue that might be uh, something that we should be following. Sure. Um, so I'm the one that comes to mind because it's the one I spend so much time on is my boss Kelly and Senator Staines, who will probably be the senator for most of you. Um, we are trying to legalize and tax recreational marijuana. That is our bill. That has been Whoa. our bill for the past year. This has been, this is our big effort. Uh, we, they just met with the editorial boards across the state uh, the last couple days, and mm-hmm. we're, we've been working on this for months. And w- if we pass it through the legislature, we will be the first state to pass it, um, not on ballot initiative, but through in a bill through the legislature. Mm-hmm. We'd be the first one. We can't do a ballot initiative in Illinois. It's not constitutional. So this would be, this would be huge. I mean, we're it's it would be huge for the tax money. It would be huge for the social justice aspect. I mean, there's been tens of thousands of people who have been brought into the system for smoking a joint, which is we know is less harmful than tobacco, and those tend to be mostly minority populations. So uh, it's really time. Prohibition of marijuana in the same way that prohibition of alcohol has failed has been a failure, and we believe that that is time to end. Will so this, if they pass this, would that affect anyone that's now serving time? Great question. So no, the answer in that in the bill that we have is no, but Kelly also has a bill, HB 1804, that would do just that for everything. So when the legislature um, passes anything that lowers a sentence or reduces a sentence, people in prison who were sentenced under the old guidelines can petition a judge and say, hey, the legislature changed the penalties for this, bring, please bring my sentence down. So we are also trying to do that because it is not just for people to be in jail for something that people outside can then do legally. And what exactly does the bill say? So right now, and this is going to change in the next month or so because we're still drafting, but right now it's you can have up to, I don't know know if many of you are familiar with the the weights and measures, but an ounce of marijuana, it's 28 grams, um, you can buy or possess um, from... Just in, and I don't know if you're familiar with any other rec states, but there'll just be stores like a shop down on Clark. There is already a medical dispensary on Clark Street, but it could open its doors to um, just anyone who want, anyone 21 and over who wants to come in. And so it would be you can buy up to an ounce. Uh, right now we have home grow in the bill. You could have like five plants at home if you wanted. We're trying to make it so that small businesses can get involved. It's not just big corporate entities. Is there a bill number? On there? Yeah, what HB. 23, 53. Yep. And if you Google that, there's been a lot of new, there's been a lot of press about it recently. Um, so we, and we, we, this is a realistic thing. I mean, we want to pass this um, soon. If the governor was supportive, he's not, shocker, uh, we would pass it today. How's the support for it right now? We could pass, we could pass a bill out of the House and the Senate. 
Uh, the governor would not sign the bill. That's the problem. He said as much. But we, in November, there are many candidates, including, since I am not on government time, I will tell you, my, pref my personal, this, I'm a BIS guy. Um, my, my it, the, BIS, Pritzker, have both indicated that they would um, make that bill a priority. So if either of them is elected, Chris Kennedy, in all honesty, has been less, has been a little wishy-washy. Uh, Pritzker and BIS, either one, has said that if they are governor, this will become law. So that is in November. Well, well, that's your, the revenues, will that bring in a lot of revenue in Illinois? Is About $750 million a year. Will that year. get us out of trouble? Um, sorry? Will that get us out of trouble? <laughs> no. That's the, and we, we want to be very frank about that. This is not, this is, a, this is good. It will not fix everything. But we, it's, so it's not, we're not really doing it for the revenue so much as just it's good public policy. I mean, it's, it's time. The prohibition aspect has been a failure. People, people smoke, I, I read something the other day, it was like 750,000 people in Illinois smoke marijuana. That's all? Yeah, well, I bet, I bet that's, it's actually more than, they did a survey, that's how many people said yes. So I bet it's more than that. It's, um, it, so it's crazy. I mean, it's crazy to pretend that. Yes, yeah, please go ahead. Okay. John, does that money figure, that monetary amount, include the cost of incarcerating all those? No, no. that's so the that's best part. That, no. So yeah. that was that's tax money, seven hundred fifty million. We're not talking about the cost of not incarcerating people, not arresting people, yeah. uh, business growth, jobs. You know, no. that's that's Seriously. not even factored in there. So this is, I mean, it's huge. We really and we will pass this in the next year, assuming Governor Andrews not reelected. But what is Jeff Sessions trying to do? Good point. So just yeah, the other day, exactly. just the other day, um, he did, he, it's very technical, but in the end, the, the Obama administration had a, a, what's called a Cole Memorandum, an, an outline of, he, okay, said U.S. attorneys, don't, don't prosecute this. If the states want to make it legal, medical, or recreational, don't spend, don't spend federal tax dollars prosecuting them. Uh, he repealed that memo, because he hates marijuana, uh, cannabis, but what, and Obama, <laughs> But what is the, it's not that big of a deal yet because it's still up to the jurisdictions of individual U.S. attorneys. And all of our U.S. attorneys have come out and said, most of them have come out and said, we're, we're not going to change the way we enforce anything. I mean, we, we, we don't have the money to spend going after people for smoking a joint. So uh, right now, we're not too worried about it. How, how did, how did um, the downstate reps react? Because I thought that they were the ones who were holding it up for something. You know what? In the, the funny thing is, they have at, we picked up a Republican co-sponsor on the day that this happened. We will pass this with Republican support. We've already got Republican co-sponsors. They, in, in their districts, the support is over 50%. They know that this is, they're starting to realize that this is not um, a, a city versus rural thing. Everybody, everybody does this. Everybody wants to have it be legal. So, so if, if Rauner were to stay in, which I don't think he will, and, to, and if he were to veto it, is there another process for... Sure. You could override the veto. The problem is that he is a billionaire, and an election is upcoming, and when you cross him, and you are a Republican, he has demonstrated that he will spend millions of dollars to ensure that you are not reelected. And so it's... He, he can put a brick on these kind of things. Like, we could pass this bill with Republican support if he only gave them the thumbs up. If he doesn't, and he hasn't, and he won't, uh, he will threaten them, and they have been—they have proved very liable to being threatened. Is uh, so? How does this? Is there anything in there just to backtrack about medical marijuana? Because the list of those who are on the list with a variety of illnesses yeah. is pretty limited, and correct. Also, yeah, which and and the rigmarole they had to go through. In the event, my brother's involved in that, and they had to rent a truck just to bring the paperwork, literally to the. So would that also? Even yeah. So that's a great question. So Kelly, Representative Cassidy, was also the one who helped pass that bill, and that is the most restrictive medical marijuana law in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, we passed that with one vote to spare. Things have changed a lot in Illinois since then, but that. So we are going to try to open that up. Okay. So the from both ends, we're going to try to get rid of the. the Crazy finger. I don't know if any of you are trying to go through yes. this. You have to get fingerprints. Even if you donate yeah. money, it's crazy. If you donate money to a specific right. an investor, you and there's not and there's uh, there's nothing for pain, which most chronic pain. pain. So, so, pain, let, pain, so yeah. let me yeah. quickly say. So the 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 Narav Shah is the director of public health. He's the one who people petition to get things like chronic pain added. He always shuts them down. He is an appointee of 
Governor Bruce Rauner. Mm -hmm. So if you have a different governor, things get added. And uh, Senator Don Harmon, he's in Chicago down the south side, just filed a bill to allow for when you're prescribed opioids for pain, mm -hmm. you could exchange that for medical mm -hmm. marijuana instead, which wow. is less addictive, wow. less dangerous, less liable to kill you, and uh, would get the chronic pain aspect. Sure. Mm -hmm. That's so. the worst, because all the other states, all, all of them, they all have chronic pain. And, and they should. While Illinois has very targeted rare yeah. diseases. Like Fibromyalgia yeah. and very yeah. specific things. Yeah, yeah. Arthritis. Arthritis. Yeah, but right. if you have chronic pain, it covers everything. It's terrible. And, and medical would stay the same under legalization. It, the, there wouldn't be any taxes on it. And the taxes would be much lower. Okay. So if you if you were a medical patient, you could you would keep your medical card because you would pay a lot less money for your medicine. Because mm -hmm. I would think that the medical is a different grade. So if you it is, and it's also and it would also you'd allow to have more and more potent because right. as your doctor prescribes. Yeah. Exactly. Same. Yeah. It's all for me. More CBD. Well, thank you for being here, John. And um, we'll end the segment right now. We'll give you a round of applause. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, and, and thank you all for doing this and giving your time to be here. And thanks to Lenny for inviting me. It's been awesome. Yeah.